it is said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And the problem with that, when we're talking about faith in Christ, salvation, eternal life in the Bible, when Jesus was here, there weren't any cameras. When the Lord created things and as he worked in the lives of the people and the places and events, they couldn't take pictures. They couldn't have those now. Even as short as Washington crossing the Delaware or things that we read about in our early American history, there weren't cameras there for people. Today, everybody's phone is a camera and people are taking pictures of everything. God had to make a picture with his words. And years ago, I had started ministering to people about salvation in Christ, but I didn't understand the depth that there was in the Bible through those pictures. And that's really something that launched me into the ministry. That's really something that changed my life. And as we are approaching Resurrection Sunday, I continue to talk about the events and things that took place regarding Jesus in Scripture. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about those pictures, those word pictures that God painted, using just a few of them. Uh, there's so many, and I love them all, and I hope that these also are inspiring to you. So, number one, <clears throat> what does the Bible claim about a plan from God, a plan of God. It's really a plan for the salvation of fallen mankind. Mankind fell, separation between all of the generations that followed Adam, and what did God plan or know about those things? Starting with 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, for as much as you know, you think sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, well, you know, it's a terrible habit. If you say you know after like every, everything you say or just before you make a statement, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed, purchased back, okay? Redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was foreordained, set it, God set it up. It was established. This is what was going to happen. This was the plan. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. Jesus, salvation in him, his death, burial, and resurrection, him dying on the cross for us, that was put into place before God made the world. God's pretty smart. He, I do not think, is standing back manipulating things all the time, every event that takes place. He did not set out before he made the foundation of the world with every single event that was going to take place. I've had people tell me that they think he did that. In fact, there are denominations of Christians, mainline denominations of Christians, where the joke is, you know, you're walking down the street and you trip on a rock and you laugh about the fact that God placed that rock to be there before he made the world because he set everything up ahead of time. There are Christians who believe that you cannot choose to be saved. God had it set up that you were going to be saved. You cannot choose to believe God had it set up ahead of time before he even made the, made the world that you were going to be born and you were going to believe. I think we have free will. I think that we can choose or choose not. It's up to us. But before the foundation of the world, God had it planned that Jesus would die on the cross for our sins. He would be risen from the dead. 
he would sit at his, God's right hand and make intercession for us. That whole plan was in place. Was it in place because Adam and Eve could sin? I hope so. Let's go on. Revelation 13, 8. All that dwell upon the earth are going to worship the Antichrist, him whose names were not written in the book of life, the life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Once again stating, God had it planned. This is Revelation. The previous verse was 1 Peter. Someone was going to pay. Adam did wrong. He deserved to be punished. God's ha God has one punishment. Separation from him, eternal death, that's it. We say, do that and you get that. Do this and you get that. Do that and we, we've got a level of things. God has one punishment. It's death. Somebody had to pay. Somebody had to pay the price somebody was going to pay. And who decided to pay it? God decided to pay it himself through Jesus ahead of time. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw in a vision um, and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Um, that's one of the verses where people say, if you read that simply, it says there, the names are going to be written in the book before the foundation of the world. Before that was done, the names are written. You can't change it. Why should we go out and preach or evangelize if you can't change it? Why should we tell anybody about Jesus if you can't change it? But if you read it a different way, it's the book of life that existed from the foundation of the world. Not that the names were written in there from the foundation of the world, but the book was there and the names are written upon our salvation, upon our faith that Jesus died on the cross and has risen from the dead. It reads very simply there, those are the words, the book of life from the foundation of the world. Okay, You get an opportunity to choose to have your names written there. The book existed. It was God's plan. Throughout our lives, we choose whether or not we're going to believe and have our names written there. Okay, so God, without a camera, he created these pictures. One of my favorites concerns a serpent made of brass. Numbers, Old Testament, 21, 6 through 9. The people of Israel were being disobedient the people of Israel were doing everything wrong. And because of that, the Lord sent fiery serpents, snakes, amongst the people. They bit the people, and a whole bunch of the people, many of the people, much of them from Israel, died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. You know, that's after you get after you get slapped good. You say, oh, I did that wrong. Well, that's what they did here. You know, all these people are dying. The snakes are with us. We're all going to get bit. We've sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you, Moses. Pray to the Lord that he take these serpents away from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make you a fiery, brazen, a brass serpent, and set it on a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks at the serpent of brass, when he looks upon it, will live. So Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and it came to pass, if a serpent bit any man, when he looked at the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, we know that from a scientific point of view, if you get a snake bite from a deadly poisonous snake, looking at something does not cause that snake bite to not make you sick. 
but God can do anything. And God was painting a picture. Couldn't take a snapshot later. God was painting a picture with his words and with the actions that he was having people do. What you have to ask yourself is, why a serpent? Serpent is, a, is Satan. Serpent is like the devil. The devil's identified. We'll read that verse in just a little bit. Why put a serpent onto a pole? Why would looking and believing that the serpent could heal you, why would God have them do that? And if you understand the idea of having symbols throughout the Bible that point to an event that was so life-changing, so world-altering, Jesus on the cross, then you can understand. So, John 3.14, Jesus speaking, claimed that that event, the brass serpent, was pointing to him. Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must Jesus, the Son of Man, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus laid claim to that event, saying, that event pointed at me. I am the serpent of brass. I hung on the pole. I'm going to. I am the one that if you look to me and believe on me, you will have forgiveness and eternal life. I'm the one. Jesus again in John 12, 32 through 33, continues and says, if I be lifted up, if I get crucified from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And that he said, signifying the type of death he should die. They weren't going to stone him to death. They weren't going to stab him. They weren't going to shoot him. I mean, they didn't use guns. They weren't going to take a sword and cut off his head. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be lifted up on a pole off the earth. Revelation 12, 19. Why a serpent? Revelation 12, 9. The great dragon was cast out of heaven, coming in the future. He's called that old serpent. He's called the devil. He's called Satan. And he deceives the whole world. Okay? What did Jesus do on the cross? He took upon himself laid upon him as he was preparing to die all of your sin, all of my sin. The Bible says that he actually didn't know sin himself. He wasn't a sinner himself. He'd, from his birth, he had done everything right because he was God in the flesh. But he became sin. He was made to be sin on the cross in our place. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21 He hath made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be, the ma be made the righteousness of God in him. It's an <clears throat> a more than even exchange. Jesus becomes all evil. And that includes things that might be abhorrent to you. Jesus became everything that anybody has ever done wrong. He became those things. He became a child molester, he became a rapist, he became a robber, he became a murderer, he became every sin that there is on the cross, all inspired by the devil himself and evil. Jesus, who had no sin in himself, became sin when he hung there on the cross. So that's why it's a serpent. The serpent is a representative of Satan. The serpent is a representative of the devil. He's the representative of the ultimate evil. So Jesus hangs on the cross becoming the ultimate evil so that we could become his righteousness. He gets my bad and I get his good. Yay. I mean, <laughs> hooray. Seems horrible, but God chose to fix it. Just like a parent might choose to take the punishment for a child. God chose to fix it through Christ. 
That's a beautiful symbol of what? It's not Easter, but the crucifixion and resurrection day is all about. Okay, another beautiful symbol. Judas and the potter's field. In, um, let's see. I put Zechariah here. I'll go ahead and read that one. I'm looking and wondering if I put this out of order, but that's okay. Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. The value is a prophecy. 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast those 30 pieces of silver unto the potter. It's a good price for what I was appraised at, for what I was prized at, the value of me. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and I cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So there's a prophecy spoken long before Jesus is ever born, okay? Matthew, you know the story of Judas. He's the one that betrayed Jesus. Matthew 27, three through 10. Then Judas, which had betrayed Jesus, when he saw that Jesus was condemned to death, repented. And he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed innocent blood. And the chief priests and elders said, that's not our problem. That's really what that means. What's that to us? You sinned, we paid you 30 pieces of silver, you delivered Jesus. If you think that's wrong, too bad, your problem. You just have to see to it yourself. And Judas, verse five, cast down the pieces of silver, where, in the temple? Where'd the prophecy say it was going to be cast down? In the house of the Lord. And Judas departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for us to put them in the treasury because they're the price of blood. Very easy to see there. The pieces of silver represented the value of Jesus, who he had betrayed. And the chief priest took the silver pieces, put them into the treasury, they can't. So verse 7, they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Now, I have been told, of course, I am not thousands of years old. I have been told that the potter's field is the field where they, if you've ever made a pot on a, on a wheel, if you've ever made, sometimes it goes wrong. If you've ever put a pot or anything into a kiln, sometimes it just doesn't come out right. And they would throw those away in the potter's field. And the potter's field really couldn't be farmed because it has all of these broken pots in it. And so the symbolism is quite beautiful. The value of Jesus is used to purchase the field, the whole world, for all the cracked and broken pots that are in it. You're a crackpot. And I'm a crackpot. And we're all here in the field and we're broken and we're flawed and we're not worth anything. And still, God loved us enough that the value of Christ who dies for us, who sheds his blood for us, who makes the payment to redeem us, purchases the whole field where all the broken pots are. It's a beautiful picture. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremy the prophet saying, okay, I gotta stop there. What did I read the first time? Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Interesting that in Matthew it says, then was spoken the words by Jeremy the prophet. Jeremy is Jeremiah. If you go to Jeremiah, it's not in there. Could it have been written and then not continued to be included? Yes. Could Jeremiah have said that and 
Zechariah also said that, and it's only recorded in Zechariah? Yes. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons and ways. I'm even told, and once again, I wasn't there. I'm even told that Jeremiah was the name of the scroll that contained more than just the prophets of Jer prophecies of Jeremiah. That the scroll of Jeremiah included Ezekiel. And so they could be saying, like it's written in the scroll of Jeremiah, they didn't go on and say in Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. Any of those things could be true. There's no reason to say this is wrong. Oh, they must have made a mistake because it says it, it was in Jeremiah. It, they, said it, they said it, you've got to see that the Bible has a... No, there's lots of ways without even twisting anything. That was what was spoken. So... Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jer Jeremy the prophet, saying, They took thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and they gave them for the potter's field. Trust the Bible. It's, it's true. It's true. If you want to try and find, guess what? If you try and fall in fault with something, you will find it. But that doesn't make the fault real. You will just see it. So many things with that. Another beautiful picture of Jesus dying on the cross and the things that took place concerns a man named Barabbas. Your name's Barabbas. My name's Barabbas. All of our names are Barabbas, symbolically. Matthew 27, 16 through 26. And they had then a notable prisoner. I mean, not just a run-of-the-mill prisoner. Somebody got picked up for driving too fast, got a ticket, couldn't pay the bill, you know, got tossed in jail. They had a notable prisoner, some important prisoner who'd really done some wrong. His name was Barabbas. And therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto all the people, Every year at this time, I release a prisoner to you. Whom will you have that I release unto you now? Barabbas or Jesus that is called Christ? For Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered Jesus to him. And when he was sat down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, Have nothing to do with that, that just man, Jesus. For I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask that Barabbas be released instead of Jesus and that they should destroy Jesus. The influence of people. People stir up, if you read or see old time movies or even historical, somebody gets the crowd stirred up. You've heard of a mob. They'll get the mob factor going. They get the crowd stirred up. And so the governor said unto them, Come on, which of these two would you have me release unto you? And the crowd shouts, Barabbas. Give us the thief, the murderer. Give us the bad guy. And Pilate says, Well, then what do you want me to do with Jesus, who's called Christ? And again, they cried out, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, but what, what evil has he done? But they just kept crying out more and more, let him be crucified, let him be... You ever hear people chant like that? Let him be crucified, let him be crucified, let him... You can imagine the crowds shouting, have him be killed. Verse 24, And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail anything, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Now, the Jews did not have the authority to crucify someone. Only the Romans did. And you may have heard someone talk about how the Jews need to be blamed for Jesus' death. Well, they were shouting, crucify him, yes. Pilate didn't even have to ask if they wanted to get Jesus released. He could have just done it because he didn't think Jesus was guilty of anything. But the Jews could not have Jesus crucified. 
Only the Romans could do that. Only Pilate could order it. And so, as you continue, you will see that that is true. He washed his hands and said, I'm innocent. No. Verse 25, he answered the people and said, his blood be on us and our children. No, it's the wrong thing to do. Verse 26, and he released Barabbas unto them. And he had Jesus beaten when he had scourged Jesus. Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. He had the power. He didn't have to do anything. The Romans had Jesus crucified. Pilate just listened to the people. And so Barabbas deserved to die. He deserved to be executed. You can imagine in the execution here, modern day, they're going to inject somebody with a poison that's going to kill them. They're going to electrocute them. They're going to use gas, whatever way they're going to try and do it. And everybody's set up and somebody walks in, out in front and say, says, well, you know, this good guy over here, he's volunteering. How about if we execute him and we'll just let the murderer go? And the crowd shouts, yes, let the murderer go and we'll execute the volunteer. Sounds terrible, but that's what's happening here. Jesus, who doesn't deserve to die, takes the place of the guy who does deserve to die. Jesus, who doesn't deserve to die, takes your place. That's why your name is Barabbas and my name is Barabbas. We're all guilty and we all deserve to be punished from God. We've all done things that are wrong. And as such, we all deserve the punishment that Jesus takes our place. Praise be to God that Jesus takes our place. And for the last thing today, what about the veil of the temple? Um, <clears throat> Many years before this, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared, okay? We don't know what happened to it. We don't know where it went. Some people claim that it was stored in a cave underneath Golgotha's hill, and that when Jesus died on the cross, his blood trickled down the cross, went through a crack in the ground, and fell on top of the Ark of the Covenant. That's an interesting thought. It's just, it can't be proved, and they haven't found the Ark of the Covenant to our knowledge. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was a curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. The most holy place was where the Ark of the Covenant stood. And the priest could only go in there once a year with the blood and sprinkle the blood on the ground. And he'd stand on the blood and sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant and God would watch and declare that the sins of the people were temporarily forgiven. Now the ark is missing, but the veil is still there. So in the temple, there's still a veil, just no ark behind it. And they still celebrate all the things that are happening at this point of Jesus' crucifixion, but there isn't an ark. But the veil's still in play, okay? Matthew 27, 50 through 54, at the time of Jesus' death. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. That's a poetic way to say he died. He gave his last breath. He cried out, and behold, <clears throat> the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, indicating who tore it. God tore it. Wasn't somebody standing there, it's a big veil. Wasn't somebody standing there and ripping it from the bottom up? God reached down and tore the veil from the top to the bottom. There was an earthquake, the earth did quake, and rocks broke in half. And, now this is really important, the graves were opened, the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and those are the bodies of the people who were in paradise. They were resurrected, entered into their new bodies now, and they came out of the graves, and what's these next few words? After Jesus' resurrection. So, we know something happened because as this finishes, you'll see why. 
But I can tell you that when Jesus said, it is finished, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, when he gave up the ghost, the graves were not opened and the people did not come out. That didn't take place until after Jesus was put into the tomb three days and three nights later, because it says it happened after his resurrection. How much of the things before that took place, like the earthquake? I don't know how much of that took place. Some of it did, because as we go on, the centurion and the people standing there saw what was going on. And so the graves were open, the bodies of the saints arose, they came out of the graves after his resurrection, went into the city, appeared to many, People witnesses the, witness the fact that there's Jacob, there's Isaac, there's, there's Joseph, there's, there's all of these dead people. They're alive and they're walking through the city. Verse 54, and when the centurion, the head of a hundred Roman soldiers, who was there by the cross and others who were with him, were watching, they were watching Jesus. They saw the earthquake. They saw the things that were done. They feared greatly saying, truly this was the Son of God. So some of those events took place. Maybe all of them except for the bodies coming out of the graves after his resurrection. Big question. Jesus is the Son of God. God in the flesh. Were they saved? Interesting. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, what? God raised him from the dead. They couldn't see that. That hadn't happened yet. Okay? Were they saved? You know, if they said, Jesus is the Son of God, he really is the Son of God, and they died... Their spirit would have gone to paradise. Jesus would have told him, told them all what he had done through it all, explained it, and Jesus would have led them to heaven because the Bible said, like we talked about before, that he led those captive in, in paradise. He led them, and they ascended also. Okay? I don't know if the centurion was saved. It's the same way where I don't know if, if uh, Judas was saved. It says he repented. But then he hung himself. I don't know if he was saved. Of course, we can't really know if anybody else is saved. You only know if you believe. If you believe, then your belief will lead you to eternal life. If you trust that Jesus is Christ, he is Son of God, he's God in the flesh, he died on the cross for our sins, he's resurrected from the dead, I believe. If you believe, you have eternal life. It's something that was established and written before the earth was even formed that this is how salvation was going to be available for us. I think it's the only way that we can have eternal life is through that faith in Christ. So praise be to God, he knew ahead of time and he painted the pictures for us to see. It makes the Bible and the whole story so very believable because it's consistent all the way through over thousands of years. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the wisdom of your word, the opportunity to have faith for Christ being available for us, for our eternal salvation. And we lift up our heartfelt love and thanks for that eternal life that you make available unto us. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you've never prayed and let God know that you do believe, why don't you do that with me now? And even if you do believe and have let God know, maybe you just want to renew your faith, why don't you pray with me? You don't even have to say the words out loud. You have to believe them in your heart. God hears the hearts of men, and you can confess Christ later, before men. So pray this prayer with me. Just think it in your heart and mind and say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I know he died on the cross for me. I believe he came back from the dead. I pray that you'd come into my life. 
forgive my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless. So glad you came out today. This evening, Food Fellowship and Bible Study. If you've got any questions, I'll be happy to talk with you and answer them.